Alrighty, so Parshas uh, Balak. And today's learning is for the continued of Shalema of Ahuva Bas Esther. So remember last week we talked about a little baby who, who needed a heart transplant? Yeah. Whose grandmother is davening over there? So, Baruch Hashem, that baby got a heart transplant and is recovering. And uh, but she should continue to have a refor shlema, along with all holy amcha Yisrael. So, all righty, Parshas Balak, which is very much about Balak and Bilam. And I'm assuming you all know the story. And you should know the story. And in general, come into the class knowing the story of the Parsha. And what we have to discuss is the very strange character of Bilam. Bilam is very odd. Number one, he is the ultimate villain. Okay? Why? Why is he the villain, by the way? What's the actual reason he's the villain? He doesn't go against Hashem at all. He says straight out to the messengers, listen, I know Bullock wants me to, to curse the Jews, but I'm telling you right now, there is not one word that is going to come out of my mouth. That's not what Hashem wants. I'm, there's, I can't say anything at all other than what Hashem tells me to say. And he goes ahead and only says blessings. He only prophesied. Everything he says is a blessing. And the famous, most famous of all is who? Is which blessing? Matovu. We say it every day in davening. Straight out of Bilaam's mouth. Right? All right, next. So why is he so bad? Because he wanted to curse, but he couldn't. Is that why he's so bad? Hmm? Okay. The advice he gives at the end. So go ahead. What's the advice he gives at the end? To give the women to seduce. Okay, so if you look at Pasuk to, uh, chapter 25 on page 874, okay, he gave advice at the end. So here he goes, okay, and this advice is attributed directly to Bilam, and that's why Bilam is, is uh, he's killed as Nekama for, for in, you know, for a revenge against... Uh, you know, he's killed as an act of revenge for what he did against B'nai Israel. So here's Bilaam. Let's, let's build his character a little further, okay? He's not just a great prophet from the nations who had the capacity to curse the Jews and the desire to curse the Jews, uh, but wasn't allowed to curse the Jews. That's Bill, and then the good guy who gave the worst advice that caused a terrible plague uh, among the Jews. That's Bilam when we meet him here in the Torah. However, he has a previous life. As an advisor to Paro. He's known as perhaps an advisor to Paro. He's also identified in Sefer Eov as the friend Elihu who appears at the end of the Sefer. All right? Let's think about that for a little bit. This is the story of Eov. This is not in your notes. Hopefully your notes will be here in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Let's go back. The story of Eov is a person. We do not know when he lived. He is associated with many different people. Essentially, he's every man who goes through Yisurim and who is um, and, and is questioning how do, you, what, you know, how do you respond to Yisurim? And in this story, which, by the way, according to Chazal, a very strong opinion is this whole Sefer, thank you, Tamara. Thank you. This story is, uh, according to Chazal, many opinions are that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this book of Eov. Because, of course, if you're the, if you're the teacher of the world's most, you know, greatest religion, the, the religion that claims truthfully, that it is revealed by Hashem directly to the Jewish people, you must have a working, you know, position <coughs> on why good people suffer. And the Torah doesn't write in essay form. And so the whole entire book of Eo does deal, deal with this issue. And it is appropriate that Moshe would, being the one that we spoke about last week, ask Hashem, please reveal to me this, this, this enigma of why good people suffer and why bad people might prosper. Why? It's like that. 
Hashem said, you can't know me while I'm alive, you, while you're alive. But we said that Hashem did say to him, it's not the way you see it. Now Moshe Rabbeinu, according to Chazal, goes and writes an entire say for Eov not to answer why, the question that he did not get an answer to, why good things happen to bad people. But in living in a life, going on a journey, everyone's on their own journey, that does bring, you know, that a person encounters or meets along the way, is forced to pass through patches of their journey, which are very difficult, bitter, hard, things happen to people. There is Yisurim, there's suffering. And the question is not why. The question is what to do, how to react, how to deal with it, how to respond to it, where to put it, how to sort it all out in your head, how to go forward with it. That's what Sefer Eov is. Not why it's going on. Eov never got an answer to why it's going on, just what do you do with it? Now, Eov had three friends who at the end of the Sefer are severely criticized by Hashem and called Rashaim. Okay? Because the ultimate definition of Russia is they do not know what to do with what they've been invested with. Hashem invests in a, a tremendous amount of kohos into a person, and Russia has no idea what to do with it, and is lurching from moment to moment, passion to passion, impulse to impulse. There is no consistency. There's no direction. It's all about what it feels right and seems right to me right now, irregardless of everyone else, irregardless of a bigger plan, irregardless of everything. That's a Russia, okay? Um, they're called Rishayim because their attitude, three friends, their basic approach to Eov, and they just get like more and more strident about it as the Sefer goes on, is the following. Clearly, Eov, you're suffering because you sinned. Obviously, because Hashem is just, and Hashem is fair, and Hashem knows everything and controls everything, so if you are suffering, then clearly you sinned, and all you should really do is think about where your sin lays, find your sin, do tshuva, and everything will go away. Okay, Eov insists, and the Sefer, and in the Sefer, God himself reiterates that Eov is innocent. This is not true. He is, there is no sin. There is no kapara necessary. God is not punishing him. There is no sin here at all, no fault to be found in Eov. He is an innocent person suffering. Now, the purpose of Eov's test is to see, and Eov was not considered a Jew, and he was meant to be a leader and a mentor for the non-Jewish world, how to handle suffering. In other words, how to know and trust and feel confident that you are in good hands and that everything is happening and Hashem knows about it despite the fact you don't understand why. That's what it's for. To be able to accept Yisurim without having it completely, you know, um, blow up your entire capacity to live and go forward and be positive. It's accepting, knowing that you're in good hands despite the fact you don't know why you're, this is happening. So Eov, by the way, does not su succeed at this. He constantly demands an explanation. And he says, and I can't go forward if I don't have an explanation. That's the failure. So Eov's three friends are constantly telling him, you're a Russia, you're, the more you deny that you sin, that proves how bad you are. Just do your do tshuva and everything will go away because Hashem is just. And, and as he denies that he's guilty, they get more and more attacking, vicious, and uh, accusatory. In the end, one new friend shows up called Elihu. That's Bilam, according to Chazal, in his younger years. And he's the only one that gets it right. And he doesn't blame Eov. And everything Elihu says is correct. He gets it. He says, and he was a tzaddik. And he said, the reason you're so confused is because generally life does make sense. And generally you can see hashkacha. And generally you can see bracha. And right now, you can't figure it out. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit into the whole story. You are a perfect person. You were a tzaddik. Why is this happening? And therefore, it's confusing. But you, you have to settle down. You have to come to a place of acceptance of the fact that you don't understand. He never blamed him. He never accused him. He never took, he was, he understood the ways of Hashem are not knowable to people. And that doesn't mean we're abandoned. It doesn't mean Hashem is angry, and it doesn't mean Hashem is, is, hates us. Elihu got it right. Elihu was Bilam. He understood Hashem's ways. I mean, no one understands, but much more than the others. By the way, in the end of the Sefer, Hashem says regarding the friends, they were Shayim on two accounts. First and foremost, they persecuted you. They accused you, an innocent person, of being a sinner. Why did they do that? Why were they so cruel to you? And you know what the answer is? Because they thought it was their job to defend me, to explain me. 
And it's no one's job to explain Hashem and defend Hashem. Hashem doesn't, isn't asking anyone to do that. And in order to try to explain God and defend God, they had to find fault in humans. And it's not such a simple equation. It's not two plus two is four. So Elihu is the one who, first of all, understands Hashem's ways. He understands that you can't, uh, that everything is, there's Hashgach on everything. And that's why he says to Bullock later on, he still gets that. I'm not going to be able to do anything that Hashem doesn't let me do. But where did the hatred come from? Where did the desperate desire to bring the Jewish people down come from? Where's that? If you know the truth and you operate based on it, where, do you, where does the hatred for it come from? That's the question. Okay? So now we're going to, do I have a handout? Is there one extra one? I got an extra one. Thanks. Oh, good. Thank you. So now we're going to do some comparisons. Okay, and you know what, I, you, uh, in the end, Bilam's advice was to Balak, look, we couldn't get anywhere trying to curse them, so I have a really good idea for you, okay? These Jewish people, they're unique, okay? And, they have, and Hashem has high expectations from them. And one of the things that Hashem absolutely hates is in us, sexual, uh, you know, licentiousness and morality, plus avodazara, which, by the way, both go together. They're both very similar. We did that last year. And betraying, Avodazar is betraying God for a false provider, so to speak. And Zunus is, I mean, Zunus is, is also turning your hopes and, 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 and attention and connecting to someone who, who's not, who has no commitment to you. Nothing. It's like Avodazar has no commitment to you. This other woman has no commitment. This, right? So, um, so he says, get them to do Avodazar. Send in the girls, the daughters of Midian. They'll all become involved in a Vodazara and Zanus, and then Hashem will be furious, and that'll be the end of them. And he was right. This Hashem doesn't tolerate these things, and there was a big plague. Okay. And he's blamed for it. So where did he get this hatred from? So now, look at what Pirkei Avos says. Pirkei Avos starts out with a, com- a comparison here. It's on your sheets or in your sitter. A comparison between Avraham and Bilam. Okay? And the comparison runs very deep, not just in traits, but in, in you'll see, in parallels to their mission. And this, the, uh, these ideas, you can see some are from Rabbi Menachem Liebtag, who compares Avraham and Bilam so beautifully, and some, of course, are from Moshe Shapiro Zephon Avraham. So on the first page, you see Pirkei Avos. And Pirkei Avos says, and listen to this, Lashon, the specific language, anyone who has these three traits, these three things, is from the students, okay, Mitalmidov of Avraham. Who was Avraham? He wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu. Avraham was not the teacher of Torah. He was the founder of the principles that led to the receiving of Torah, correct? The Avos founded the principles and they established the foundation that Torah could be built upon. So among the students of Avraham, okay, what? The, the, and the other three things are from the students of Bilam. Okay, Avraham, a good eye, eye and tov, a humble spirit, okay, ruach mocha, and a small appetite. We're going to have better words for that. A nefesh, okay, a nefesh, uh, a uh, a nefesh um, shvela. Okay, and then the opposite, a ho- an evil eye, a haughty spirit, and a broad appetite. This is from Bilam. Now, look at the next question. <laughs> what is the difference? <laughs> Okay, what difference is there between the students of Avram and the students of Bilam? Isn't it kind of self-explanatory? So he's not asking what's the difference in their behavior. That's obvious. What's the difference in living with this behavior versus that behavior? So, the students of Avram, our father, eat in this world and possess the next world. In other words, they're, they're, they're in the right place, benefiting both here and in the future. Okay? As it is stated... There is what for those that love me to inherit, and their treasuries will I fill. Okay, from Mishlei. But the students of Bilam, the evildoer, inherit Gehenna, and go down to the pit of destruction. And it is stated, and you, Hashem, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. The people of blood and deceit, they will not live out half their days. I will trust in you. So first of all, turn the page. We're talking about people. We're not even talking about, we're talking about students of Avraham. Students that don't, in other words, people that don't develop the traits that are even necessary to accept the Torah. Because we're not talking about accepting the Torah here. All right? 
So now look, look at the chart. We're going to do a lot more parallels to Avram and Bilam. So the first, let's look in the beginning. Thank you, Tanya, for this beautiful chart. <laughs> okay, the differences between Avram and Bilam. The first one is an Ayin Tova versus an Ayin Ra. You see what we've written? Rashi says an Ayin Tov is already in the perspective. It's in your intellect. It's how you choose to see the world. You are not jealous, okay, of other people. You do not feel everyone is a threat to you. We've talked a lot about this. Only Hashem is everybody's provider anyway. So nobody's a threat to me. That boss is not my provider of income, and that doctor is not my provider of of healing, and that person is not my provider of, of uh, my peace of mind. Hashem provides, and people are just used by Hashem as messengers, so you don't need to be jealous or get into any type of issues with other people. They're not where things are coming from anyway. So uh, Rashi says you're not jealous, and you equate your friend's honor with your own, which means you see the value of other people. They are not threats. They are benefits. Everyone has a journey. Everyone has a mission. Everyone's important. Okay, and you're not, and of course, not as we said, not threatened by achievements and successes of others. The opposite is jealousy, feeling threatened, no concern for others. It's a survival of the fittest mode. Okay, it's an attitude, survival of the fittest. That is definitely Billam. Okay, a humble spirit. Now, don't forget. Now we're getting into that was intellect. Now we're getting into the ruach, which is associated with the emotions, and that is humble, meaning you do not hold yourself superior. Rashi calls it bending the knee. You emotionally feel um, empathy. It's essentially empathy for other people, connection. Okay, and uh, you you know you can relate to them versus uh, no empathy, etc. And then Rashi says regarding a nefesh, that's already like the physical body of a person. There are our actions in the physical world. Um, not conceited, you associate with and is one of the regular people is sensitive to how our actions will affect them as opposed to an endless desire to pl for pleasure. This is not Rashi, by the way. Rashi just says not conceited and is one of the people. But the extension of this is uh, that uh, you don't feel one of the people. You have a broad, you have a, your body wants everything, okay? And it's irregardless if the people, if it's good or been harmful or not harmful to the other people, it's irrelevant. You're not one of the people. You have your own, your own needs. Who cares about else? As my kids used to say, jokingly, nobody else has feelings. <laughs> okay. So, um, so uh, that's that. This is the absolute difference between them. And obviously, with these midos, you can begin to even consider going to the next step. And without them, not. Now, look at the parallels because clearly both of them had a mission. Look at the parallels between Bilam and Avraham. First point. Okay, what does Hashem say to Bilam? And what does Bilam, um, what does Balak say to Bilam? I know that who you curse will be cursed, and who you bless is blessed. Who said that to who? Hashem said that to Avraham. Those who curse you will be cursed, those who bless you will be blessed. All right? And Balak understood that Bilam also, in a strange way, had the power to key in so directly to the, to the reality of what was going on here, that if Bilam understood that that uh, that he can pull down that same equation, that um, he gets what blessing is, he gets what curse is, he knows who's aligned with which one. Okay, and that's what he said. I can't curse the Jews. All right. Second of all, all right, they both come from the same place. They both come from, all right, from Abraham Naharayim. Which is on the river Euphrates, on the on the Nahar Prat, from where the two rivers join. They both are originating from the center of civilization. This is very important. The center of civilization. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. Avram did start out in the center of civilization, but he moved to a backwater called Canaan, and the Jewish people did grow up as become formed as a nation in the center of civilization in Egypt. But they moved to back to the same backwater called Canaan. We do come from the center of civilization, but we leave it because Judaism is essentially a protest movement <laughs> against the norms that define these centers of civilization. Bilam is not a protest movement. Bilam understands that the Jewish people are different and are a protest movement, but he is he represents what often defines the norm, okay? And he's, he clearly can identify the norm and the protest against it, all right? Next, okay, look at them. Both are so anxious to accomplish their most important 
highest calling. For Abraham, that highest calling was the Akedah. And for Bilam, the highest calling was the cursing or the attempt to harm the Jewish people. As you see, it says they both got up early, they both saddled their donkeys, and they both took their two servants, and they both ran. See that? For Avraham, it's to, the protest is that we are, as we've spoken about this many times, so completely infused with an awareness of Hashem in our midst that we no longer can distinguish between my needs and my preferences and what her, I need versus what Hashem wants. If Hashem wants it, then it's what I want. It's if there's an absolute flow, if this is the chesed, we're part of Hashem's existence, Hashem is part of our existence, and we're so identified with that that that's what sp spurs us on. Okay? And he is spurred on by this desire to separate the Jewish people from God, from the world, from our mission. Okay? We still haven't answered where this hatred comes from. We're building it. But uh, where, you know, how did he become, how did he go bad when he knew so much? So, Rav Chaim Vital, who's a student of the Ari, asked a question regarding now this, um, these, this differences, this, this parallel between Abraham and Bilam and the differences between them. Uh, what we uh, mentioned before, number one, okay? Number one. Um, well, number three is what we mentioned before. You know, isn't the difference obvious? But he asked two very important questions. If Avraham, if, if Avraham is, has, teaches good midos, and ba uh, Bilam represents the bad midos, okay? Generally, human experience is that you don't need a Rebbe to be a creep, okay? <laughs> you don't need someone to teach you how to be conceited and narcissistic and self-centered. Like, why are they called Talmidim of Bilam? It's like, what happens when you don't try to be a Talmud of Avraham? Where is this? It's very odd. You know, you have to learn it, which means it has to come from an intellectual place. And Avraham's good midos also has to come from an intellectual place. You got you to, gotta, you know, attach yourself to a concept, an idea that you've decided to believe in, that you've learned. It's not natural. And second of all, why are these three things considered midot instead of mitzvot? For example, it's, it's forbidden to get angry, right? But there's no mitzvah specifically written to, to never get angry or to only act angry in appropriate situations and never be angry. Why are these qualities not considered mitzvot? Okay, these are our questions. So uh, to answer it, we're going to start. And you're going to read this on your own later. We're just going to sum it up. Let's talk about midos, okay? What constitutes good traits and how does one develop them, okay? How do you get to be mital midav shel avraham? Or God forbid, the opposite. All right, so Rambam has a whole little treatise, which is required reading. Remember we say the eight prakim, the shmona prakim? The little pamphlet is a must read, really everything is a must read, but um, Hilchos Deot is also a must, a must read. It's also a little small, you know, se uh, little treatise on its own. You can Google it. Rambam Hilchos Deot Chabad is the whole thing online. Thank you, Chabad, for putting everything online. And um, you could look through it, and it has the commentary. The essential idea that I want you to see is when it comes to Hilchos Deot, which you'll see here in the introduction, there's 11 mitzvahs, five commandments, and six, five positive, six negative. Now look how it goes. To emulate his ways, which you have to first learn clearly what Hashem's ways are. Okay? To cling to those who know Hashem will emulate his ways. Then you start getting, behave right, to love one's fellow Jew, to love the converts, not to hate one's Jewish brethren, to rebuke, not to embarrass. Here you're getting to behaviors, okay? Not to oppress the unfortunate, not to gossip, not to take nakama, not to bear a grudge. You're talking about behaviors. But what starts out all behaviors is to emulate Hashem's ways, which is not, it's not a behavior. It's a general instruction to v'halach the bedrachav, to go in his ways, which has to be predicated on knowing what they are. And remember when Moshe was up on Har Sinai, I didn't put this in the notes, he asked Hashem two questions. Okay? He asked Hashem, he asked Hashem, A, to understand Sadik Baralo. Okay? He said, Horeni nat kvodecha. Show me your kavod, which is how you conduct the world. And Hashem said, no. But then he said, teach me your ways. 
Okay? Teach me your drachim. What are your ways? And that Hashem answered, and he gave him the 13 meters of rachamim. Hashem, Hashem, kel rachim, v'chanon, erach, apayim, all the terms of compassion. Those are the ways of Hashem, the way Hashem conducts the world. Okay? And so you have to know them. And that's where, I didn't put this all in because we're going in a bit of, you know, the main premise here is um, that Midos starts with learning what are the ways of Hashem, okay? Now, here is Hilchas, um, Hilchas Deus, chapter 1, all right? Just to see, Rambam starts out saying, but every person is naturally endowed with various, you know, nurture versus nature, versus very... You know, certain attitudes, certain certain propensities, certain character traits, okay? And they're all different from each other. And the goal is to ultimately find a middle path, not to veer to either extreme, okay? Not to be too spidingy or too spendthrift, right? Too conceited or too humble. And he explains this, that we're all looking for that middle ground as we um, are contrasting the extremes of either side and what, and uh, the extents of them. Look at three, okay? The two extremes of each trait which are at a distance from one another do not reflect the proper path. Okay, he's going to define the golden mean, which, by the way, is similar to Aristotle, also speaks about a golden mean. And, um, and uh, now, for, I just want to mention again out in my notes, Aristotle's golden mean, his living in that balanced way is for Aristotle who did not know of Hashem beyond this world and did not accept it. That's the highest good. Rambam is not going to say these ethics are the highest good and we did that in a share a while back. He's, he's ultimately our premise is that they're necessary foundational steps to get to accepting the Torah which then brings us to a level of operation to Midos that are coming from a very different place not utilitarian like Aristotle but emulating Hashem okay very different so he does speak about the the uh, the golden mean and how you have to examine your behaviors and you're gonna flip now you're gonna read it tonight that's a prophecy <laughs> and you're going to get to page, oh, did we get page numbers this time? Oh, no, we didn't. Okay, so keep going until you're in chapter, chapter, um, until you're in, you see where it says commentary on Halacha 7? Okay. So Halacha 7 says, how do you train yourself to follow these temperaments to extent that they become a permanent fixture of your personality? That's what Ramana is going to tell you what the golden mean is, and then how do you become a person who lives and is like that, and he's going to say, not intensity of the act, but repetition, constant repetition of behavior, doing the right thing over and over again, the moderate, taking the moderate, proper middle course, unless, he says, your person has, has to do tikkun on a terribly bad meter, which means they have to go to the other extreme for a while, like a cleanse, and then they must come back to the middle. That would be like a nuzzer, by the way. Go to the other extreme and then come back to the middle. But Ramam then says, how do you, you know, get yourself into that zone where you just become that kind of person? It's about repetition. Uh, your deeds will shape your character traits. And look on where it says, commentary on Halacha 7. In the process of personal change, change the stress is on the repetition, not on its quantity or intensity. Okay? Now, turn the page here. The next page where you see, I've bolded this. Okay? Rambam says that here, he's talking about the Yetzer, the Yotzer, and he said, it is called by these terms, and they make up the middle path, which we are obligated to follow. This path is called the path of God, Derech Hashem. As stated in the commentary on the previous halacha, the path of God involves controlling our emotions. Now here's, this is the essential Jewish idea. Controlling our emotions by using our intellect, so that our behavior to the extent that is possible for a man, for a person, right, is an objective response to a situation, okay? In this manner, our behavior bears a resemblance to God's transcendence of worldly matters. In other words, a Kaddish Baruch Hu is not overwhelmed by certain emotions which cause him to have a gut reaction and behave a certain way. When we develop good midos that were balanced, it's because we have an objective ability to evaluate the situation, what would naturally be our reaction, to see the extremes of it, 
to pick a middle path and behave and respond and conduct ourselves according to that balanced path, which is determined by objectivity, a little bit of distance. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu governs the world not by, being, by reacting on a moment-to-moment -moment basis with some innate traits, but objectively choosing which traits to use at which time. Sometimes Hashem uses the trait of what we relate to as Ahava. Sometimes what we relate to as Yira or Chesed or Din. Or, there's all kinds of traits that Hashem uses to conduct the world. The Sviros, the ten Sviros, those are not personality traits, Chas Shalom. They are channels, behaviors that Hashem conducts the world with. They're ways of acting that Hashem kind of operates within, and with those types of interactions with humanity, different types, Hashem conducts the world. Okay, they're be modes of action, chosen freely by Hashem. And we too are expected to choose, properly choose freely our, our behaviors and our midos. So you do need a Rebbe. It's not natural. You need a role model, and you need someone to help a person see what the middle path is, because, and now the Rebbe is not so much only for to express the, the, the ultimate balance of the traits, and that's why even in Judaism it is very, very fundamental that somebody could, we know this, somebody could be a huge scholar, but if their mido, their character traits are not in balance, nobody's interested. Their Torah is tainted, because as we're saying here, as you're going to see, Rav Moshe Shapiro is going to teach us that these are from the students of Avraham. If you don't have the character traits in order, you can't accept Torah. Your Torah is not Hashem's Torah. It's your own Torah. These character traits are prerequisites for then living a Torah life. So um, here you need a Rebbe to teach us all right, what it is, we, Hashem's traits, how Hashem operates, Therefore, when we get to a point where we understand that, where we emulate Hashem, then we start putting things into balance. I just want to say, I had a Rebbe in a grandmother, by Bubby, who died 60 years ago at 78 and without a formal education, who taught me that. Exactly. I Everything should. should be moderation. She would say, right. not too beautiful, not too mm -hmm. tall, not too smart. <laughs> 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 went, went through that. And that well, stuck with me my whole life. It's a very important message. Um, here, look at the bottom of the page. This is from Ramesha Shapiro, okay? I quoted his words, not his words, he spoke in English, but the translation of his words, I mean, he spoke in Hebrew. One's conduct, okay, must appear as that of an intelligent being stemming from the intellect. Receiving the Torah is conditional upon good traits. Our obligation to develop good traits does not emanate, this is critical, does not emanate from our obligation to keep the laws of the Torah, rather from our obligation to accept the Torah. Okay? Avram taught us preconditions for receiving the Torah, and we have a mitzvah to accept the Torah. All right? Once we have a Torah, then we start to operate but the reason these, as Rav Chaim Vital asked, the reason these are not mitzvahs is they're, you can't even accept the mitzvahs until you have these. These are preconditions. Okay? Bil, so who's Bilam? Bilam taught the world. He has a very, very particular philosophy. It was repeated similarly by Nietzsche. Same idea. He taught the world that one can excuse oneself from developing the traits necessary for accepting the Torah. Now, this is very important. Nietzsche didn't talk like this, but we'll get to that in a second. In other words, first you have to teach, okay, that the Torah is not relevant. You don't need to listen to it. You can turn your, your you know, you can turn a blind uh, eye and a, and a deaf ear to the Torah. It's not relevant. If the Torah is not something that's relevant, you don't need to accept it then you certainly don't need to develop the traits that are required in order to accept it. Bilam, here is a Gemara in Zavachim. This is where, what, this is Bilam's, this is Bilam's, um, so to speak, not, you know, this is the damage. This ideology is, is super damaging. It is the damage that Bilam kind of like perfected first and later was repeated by you know, by, by other philosophers, particularly Nietzsche. What did he say? When the nations of the world heard the powerful and frightening noises at the time of Matan Torah, 
the Gemara in Zavachim 116a says that they ran to Bilam. Remember? He understood everything. And they said, um, they asked him, Hashem la Mabel Yashav? Is Hashem destroying the world with a Mabel again? Is this going to be another flood? He answered, no, Hashem promised never to make a Mabel again. Fearful, they replied, that although he promised not to bring a Mabel of water, he never said anything about fire. Maybe the whole world is going to explode. Perhaps he'll destroy the world with fire. Bilam answered, no, don't worry. It's just Hashem owes la'amo yitain. Hashem is giving strength to his people. The Torah, he's giving the Torah to his people. The nations of the world heard this and answered, may Hashem grant his people with peace. Hashem yivarech at amo bashalom. Hashem should bless his people with peace. What happened here? Bilam is teaching the nations that what is happening at Sinai with Israel does not concern them. He's giving his power to his people. Say, oh, good, let them be well. That is the terrible, not just mistake, damage, error, lie that Bilam perpetrated. You need not concern yourself with the fact that the Jewish people are giving, getting the Torah. Oh, let them be good. Let them, you know, let them do, I wish them success. This is the lie. Okay, in Rambam Hilchas Malachim, Hilchas, um, Hilchas um, Malachim, okay, Hil- the laws of kings, okay, he writes the following, and it's a, it clarifies that uh, the basics of the Torah, so the Sheva Mitzvahs, all right, are absolutely, positively for everybody. And let's just remember, this is not in the notes, that the way Rambam describes it in another place is that when Hashem created the world, all of humanity, there were essentially six mitzvot. Let's make sure we know them, because they're for everybody. They're the basis of the Torah. The world starts with six mitzvot. The seventh was added by Noah, Avram and Achai. But what are the first six? A Anochi Hashem. I am Hashem. Okay, you must know that there is Hashem, which, which means zero avodah It's usur for everybody. Okay, it's a violation of the basic principle. No killing, no stealing, no adultery. Okay, fair and honest court systems, justice, and and no, and this is a euphemism. It's the opposite. Blessing Hashem. It's the opposite. We don't say it. Okay, we mean the opposite. Okay, these are six misses. This was for humanity. Then Ram says Noah added Aver Menachai. You know, this terrible form of tor- torturing animals, eating li- limbs of animals, respect. Then came Avraham, and he added the bris mila. Then came Yitzchak, and he added uh, um, the Meiser, you know, tzedakah. Then came Yaakov, he added Gid Hanasheh. Then, then came Moshe and filled in the rest, all the rest. So Torah, for the Jewish people, is built on a premise where all of humanity share, and that is that there are certain basic realities that Hashem requires of all people. So when Bilam told the nations, Hashem is giving the Torah to them, oh, let them be well, he was saying to them, it's not your, it's not your business. Okay, now, if it's not your business to accept Torah, then you have, there's no place to then speak of developing, you know, positive quality traits. In other words, not living by survival of the fittest. So, um, so Rambam says straight here, listen carefully to, this is, okay, in chapter 8. Okay, Moshe only gave the Torah and the mitzvahs, okay, as an inheritance to Israel and to all those who desire to convert from among the nations. So anybody can be a Jew. We do not discriminate on any basis, okay? By the same regard, Moshe was commanded by Hashem to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. This is for everybody. It absolutely does have to do with all the nations. If one does not accept these commandments, he should be executed. In other words, if somebody knows that I don't accept not to kill, I don't accept not to steal, I don't accept not to commit adultery, I don't accept not to torture animals, I refuse. I refuse. I insist on living, killing, stealing, torturing animals, serving idols, and all those things. If somebody absolutely being asked to, refuses to, this is grounds for no longer having a right to live in Hashem's world. These are basics for everybody. Nobody is excused from these. Nobody on earth, period. Okay? A formal, a person who formally accepts these commands is called a ger toshav. If they live in Israel, they're called a ger toshav. They have all kinds of privileges 
okay? They can't work on Shabbos, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and everyone is meant to accept these commands. Now, uh, they, the, anybody who accepts these, this is a very important thing. Um, anyone who accepts these, turn the page. Uh, and uh, the fulfillment of these seven mitzvot and is precise in their, in their observance is considered the pious among the Gentiles and merits a share in the world to come. Okay? But if he fulfills them out of intellectual conviction, he is not called the Gertoshev, he is not called the Chassidit Umas Olam, nor among the wise. In other words, somebody just concludes that, like Aristotle, that it makes sense. He didn't even believe in Hashem, so that, the, but, so that he disqualifies him. But to not kill and to not steal and to, and to, you know, and to be kind to animals, I don't know if they did that in Greece, um, because it makes sense, because it's utilitarian, because of some other reason, this still isn't okay. It's still not okay. They're not chassidi um olam. They have to accept these rules because they were revealed by Hashem through Moshe to the world. That's it. This is so. When we speak with others, Jews or non-Jews, we should never feel insecure to make it crystal clear that this is not Jewish. This is every human being is expected to rise to these basic levels of awareness and 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 uh, and operation. So when, when Bilam said this, we first have to establish he was doing a terrible, absolutely terrible disservice to the people he was teaching. I don't understand how you're seeing that from this, because at the end, they bless the Jewish people, like whoever, like Hashem Shabbat, and it just anybody can, who blesses the Jewish and people and anybody, will be blessed. That's right. And so anybody who accepts the, to be a Ger Toshav, anybody who accepts the Ger Toshav is in that category. But they receive. They say, Hashem, that they are saying that Hashem is giving people his strength. That's a bracha that they're giving. That Bilam was giving to us. No, the people said Hashem owes Lamo Yitain, Hashem Yivarech et Amo Ba Shalom. Yeah, but that's a bracha. But it's considered. It's con. What's it, the negative? Because anyone who blesses us, they to bless. What that mean? Oh. Blesses us means not just in theory. Oh, let them be blessed, and I'm going to do whatever I want. Okay. Wow. <laughs> it means that it means that this is Ramesh Shapiro explaining it, and there also he brings down, by the way, a piece which I did not include. Actually, it's probably in here, where all the um, all. In fact, it's probably in the uh, in the commentary. If you go on Chabad, all the brachas that um, befall the Jewish people for abiding by Torah mitzvahs, okay, befall a person who has accepted who has committed to abide by the seven mitzvahs. They have a lot of similarities and a lot of privileges, and they are also considered among your brethren. They share a tremendous commonality with us. And, um, and even if you want to read it, they said, oh, let them be b'shalom, and, that, and not read it as, as a, and like, let them, you know, take, you know, we're absolved and let them be okay. Even if they recognize that uh, the Jewish people should <laughs> succeed, okay, which is not the message, Bill, and Bill tried to destroy the Jewish people, tried to cause them to fail. And is causing them to fail, you know, reverberated, it, it, it infected the nations. And he, he's causing it to fail, it comes, is directly related to his attitude, this has nothing to do with me, this is about them, and I don't even want them to have this success. Now, let, we're trying to figure out where it comes from, okay? The question here is, are Bilam's bad midos the reason for his attitude, or his attitude the reason for bad midos? I would argue that, in general, bad midas are always the extension of somebody's attitude. Okay? So, for example, we know that Bilam, one of the midrashim that also we did not include here, because the notes would have been 30 pages long, was that uh, he knew the moment, the precise moment of every day, that millisecond that Hashem could be, that the midas haddin of Hashem could be awakened. Why was he so... Uh, attached to the Midas Hadin. Why did he want to, why did he want the Jewish people to, to fail, to not be successful, God to become angry at them, to dis, dis you know, to, uh, to, um, you know, disconnect from them, to fail, consider the Jewish people unworthy of their mission. Why was he so determined, okay, to see the worst in the Jewish people and not see the benefit? And therefore, and that ide ideology led straight to his attitude. You know, the ideality of Nietzsche, it was, not in a nutshell, but a tiny bit of it, that the survival of the fittest, the ubermensch, 
would be that person that uh, could survive by virtue of his own strengths, determination, self-perfection, and overcoming. Very important word he used, the overcoming of the weaknesses, of the deficits. So what about those people that feel, fall between the cracks? They're not as equipped to succeed and over, overcome and be strong. What about the people that were mentally challenged and emotionally challenged and physically challenged or, or they didn't or were poor or had no influence? What was our relationship to them? Judaism, Avraham taught empathy. Empathy. Listen, everybody walks down their own path. Everybody has their own journey. Nobody can take someone else's journey. What empathy is, is having that person deeply feel that as they go on their journey, okay, and there are rough patches along the way, they're not alone, they're not doing this by themselves, there's people, someone there who will be near them, loyal to them, help them how they can help them as they go through their journey. And there's empathy means that I can feel, I don't, I'm not walking your path, but I feel how difficult your path is. I see it, and I'm here for you as you progress along it, okay? Even empathy, by the way, needs a middle ground. There's too little, which is intellectual, you know, oh, that person, let me, you know, and it could, or, and you know, that person needs X, Y, and Z, I'll take care of it because of my obligation, and it's the right thing to do. Too much empathy is, I feel their pain so much that I can't function. And I can't help them because it's, 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 you know, it's overwhelming. So I'm, I'm overcome with it and I can't do anything for them. A balanced empathy is being right by their side, but also being strong and giving them the sense that although this patch of their journey is bitter and difficult, the journey continues to new places which haven't unfolded yet. And just keep going. You'll get there. And, um, and so there's even a balance there. And the other side of it is, this, is that, no way, that was Avraham, empathy. One of the people, right? Everybody's on their journey. We're all here to help each other along the way. Ayin Tov, right? These are Avraham's mitas. Go back, back, down to the beginning, back to the first part. Ayin Tov, I'm not jealous. I don't compare my journey to someone else's journey, right? I'm not threatened by someone else's, what they're, they're you know, the ups, the, the high points of their journey, the successes and the achievements. But the other side of the extreme is, the, is Midas Hadin. Midas Hadin says that um, a person has to, it's a person's job to succeed on their own. And if they can't succeed on their own, it's no one's job to help them. In fact, Nietzsche believed that what we call good midos, empathy, compassion, charity, helping the weak and the poor and the un infirm, was a terrible, terrible distortion of the order of things. The order of things is survival of the fittest. The order of things is to overcome and be the ubermensch. And if you couldn't keep up, you didn't deserve to live. And to be compassionate to others, okay, that was a destruction of the human nature, which is to be like God, superior and, and, and uh, supreme. And all of this, and all of this compassion was leading, and it was, by the way, invented by religions, invented by the poor and the weak to help themselves, to hijack and trap everyone else. <laughs> From instead of you know exp ex uh, you know expanding their own reach, but to hold them back and divert their energies to helping the weak and the poor, and this was holding humanity back, and um, and we had to break off the shackles of this moral imperative and rise above, and only the ubermensch survives. Okay, this is Midas Hadin. Din is the opposite of the chesed. Remember Avram said, you're all part of my existence? This is the opposite. Nobody's part of my existence. Only I have to succeed. Everybody is a threat. Okay? So what you have here is, you have Bilaam, who's teaching the world that the only way you can 
comfortably live with yourself and all your bad midos, okay, which are essentially narcissistic. It's what eventually, you know, was displayed. And many people blame Nazi Germany, blame Nietzsche for Germany's um, ultimate attitude and, and philosophy, but Nazi Germany. The, the first, you know, he started with uh, murdering the, the sick and the mentally ill and the, and the you know, all the, all the, everyone in the institutions, everybody wasn't well. You know that? Lubavitcher Rebbe had a brother was killed by Hitler because he wasn't mental, he was in a mental institution. His original, original, original uh, attack of Hitler was, um, was the infirm, okay? To be the super, the ubermensch. And, uh, and how, do you get to, how do you get to live like this and justify it? It starts with learning. What is it learn? A simple, most ultimate lie of all the lies. Torah, which is built on chesed, and, and, uh, and, and our participation with God and our participation with each other, and our respect for each other, and are allowing each other to... And, and trusting it, and also, um, you know, it, um, having great expectations from each other, each one in their own way, as we've spoken about here many, many, many times, is, is designed for one, ultimately for one thing and one thing only, each one in their own way, to be a source of Kavad Shemayim, right? So one thing Hashem doesn't do for Himself. Hashem would do everything for Himself except that. To be a source of Kavod Shemayim, right? Now, to be, a, to, to be a source of honor, a participant with, and a source of honor for Hashem here, and um, in order to do that, it starts with the basic premise of knowing that we are part of Hashem and we are part of each other. Once you say the Torah is not for us, has nothing to do with us, you deny the entire basic first step, which is we're in this together with Hashem. As soon as we're not in this together with Hashem, we're in this alone, each man for himself. In which case, if it's each man for himself, then the worse your midos, the better, right? So you're having here, so Chazal is telling us, like the, and this is a very scary thing, what if you see a Torah-observant person who doesn't have these midos, whose midos are more like Bilam's than like Avraham's? Okay, so what, what is that? And that's a big chilul Hashem, as they say, that's crazy Hashem name. And this is what is, it's terrible to see, very, very disturbing. What is that? What is a so-called religious person um, who has all the bad traits? Jealousy, feels threatened, doesn't respect other people, feels superior, no empathy, craving pleasures at everyone else's expense, and, or some degree of that, and they're so-called religious. So what we're establishing here is that, first of all, that person's never, ever accepted Torah. Meaning, I don't mean the obligations of Torah. I mean the understanding of what Torah is all about, which is what we keep stressing here. In the end, the mitzvahs of the Torah, which we, which we spend our life living according to, and cannot be done correctly without these good midos. Okay, they can't be done correctly without these good traits. For example, even the midah of hachnasas archim. Right, the good, the good, the mid, the the obligation to be welcoming, to have guests. Okay, right. It's predicated on the fact that you're doing it sincerely, because you, you know, misukasa, mikasa. What is it? Mikasa, sukasa. My house is your house. It's not predicated on some desperate need to develop, to establish some status for myself as the one who has the most guests every Shabbos, or whatever. Okay, or guilt. Or maybe if I do for them, they'll do for me, or something like that. Utilitarianism. Everything is predicated on, on midos, right? So, um, so in order, so here's how it goes. In order to accept the main idea of the Torah, okay, there, which is that we are all participants in Hashem's existence and participants with each other, and yet give each other the freedom to bring out to this world their particular mission through their journey, the first thing that has to happen, Avram came before Moshe, is a chinuch, meaning that in day-to-day -day behavior, a child sees, we see, and it's never too late to adjust this, we, first of all, emulate these things in our own day-to-day -day life. The midas of Avram, we're taught to emulate these things in our day-to-day -day life. When it becomes natural for a person to feel that other people, this is the critical point, 
When it's natural for a person, and this is what's missing so much, I think, in this door, when it's natural for a person to feel and to have the confidence that both things are in play. There is a sense of empathy and participation and connection and loyalty and, and inclusivity, and at the same time, a dignity and a respect for the person and their journey and their mission and their challenges and what they have to bring to the table. When they live with these basic, you know, experience, emotional experiences, and then they can go on to understand that with Hashem it operates the same way. We're never let, abandoned by Hashem. That's what Eov learned. We're always in good hands. And Hashem's, we're part of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, as we've spoken about so many times, and He knows us as He knows Himself, but He gives us freedom and autonomy and individuality and free choice to do something unique in this world and gives us a lot of time to make mistakes and trial and error and figure it out as always tomorrow and start again and a million second chances. And then we become someone who on our own, in our way, becomes a source of Kavod Shemaim. Then when we experience that with each other, we can experience that with Hashem. When we see people that are so disconnected from Hashem and Torah lifestyle and they're angry and they're cruel and they're insensitive and they're rude and all that, it's not a rebellion against Hashem, okay? It's that they were never, they never experienced it on a one, on a personal level with each other. They don't, how can they extrapolate it to something more abstract like us and Hashem if they don't even know it from day to day life? So Bilam starts from a premise where he says, you know what, the Torah is not for us. So first of all, bad midos, you know, survival of the fittest. Then a person grows up like that. And then from that point, it becomes extremely difficult to shift completely and to become a person that can think, you know, in terms of that type of relation with Hashem. And that's what the Torah ever says. It's not, Avraham's Talmidim, they eat in this world and the next world. This life makes sense. This world, every moment, even the hard ones, the challenging ones, the bitter ones, are opportunities and can be filled with a sense of satisfaction and gratification because whatever the situation is, it can be used as a source of kavod shamayim. But, and therefore, we, you know, we know what to do with the moment. And Bilam, though, it's just a crazed, chaotic, frenzied competition of survival of overcoming everyone else, denial of anything beyond that. And so the Talmidim of Bilam, they are, they inherit, in other words, what they earn for themselves is misery. They go down to the pit of destruction, blood and deceit here and there. So how did Bilam get there? How did Bilam get there? So yeah, we asked, is the Midos first or the, or the um, so it seems to be that he knew everything in his head. He was taught it, he knew it. But he never had the midos. He never had the midos to 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 interpolate. interpolate. He, these, he and he not he didn't have the midos. It's clear, and he taught other people that they don't have to either. Justification. It's like Nietzsche. You don't have to. There's no reason to. It's wrong to. It's wrong. And he wanted the Jewish people. And here's a very important psychological thing: people who can't achieve it, what they know is right. They want everyone else who is achieving it to fail. Because they know that they could technically achieve it if they tried harder and did some adjustments inside. They could achieve it. And there are Bali Chuva who achieve, who change. But if you don't want to adjust and you excuse everything, then you get, you, instead of saying, look, you know, I opted out. You don't say I opted out. You say, let's destroy those who opted in. Yes. Even if you have the female, even if you have Migos, how are you able to, we all have to fight the Yetzirah. So, with. Okay, so define the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah, def- we all fight the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah is what? Let's make it, you know, we talk about this a lot too. What is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination? It's very, very important. It's very, it's a distinction between a Tzaddik and a Russia. It's not so complicated. It's this. Hashem has invested all of us, okay, with his own powers to be an individual, to be a creator, to f- 
find ways, as we said in previous classes, we are designed, we are hardwired to do one thing and one thing only, which is what we're supposed to create, which is to be a source of Kavot Shemaim. Remember this. Hashem can do everything for himself in his own world. He doesn't need us for anything. The one thing Hashem doesn't do, so, and he made it that we can't do it for ourselves either, is give ourselves kavod. This is the, this is the point. Humans are wired to be kavod givers. Everybody says, okay, let's just for two minutes here. All of philosophy is, all of philosophy, Western philosophy from the earliest times is designed to answer three questions. What sort of creature am I? Okay, what is my purpose? And how then shall I live or be governed? Now, on that question of what is my purpose, and, and Viktor Frankl, what is my purpose? Everybody wants to know my purpose. It's just another, let's use other words. What is there out there that is worth me devoting myself to, sacrificing for, harnessing all my creative energies towards that goal? What is out there that I can respect, that I can give kavo to, that will not disappoint me, that is eternal and true? What is out there, instead of the word par purpose, what is my purpose? What is out there that is worthy of my kavo, of my reverence? We are designed to find something to revere and to devote ourselves to. That's the only thing we do in this world. The difference between a tzaddik and a rasha is the rasha has no idea, doesn't want to know, okay, that what's worthy of revering is HaKadosh Baruch Hu and our connection and our participation in Hashem's world. And so they take this huge urge for giving kavod to something greater and they just put it on themselves. It must be me. I am the address for all that kavod, and no one else matters because I have to rise up and have more kavod than everybody else and have greater status, power, influence, persuasion, and control and determine everything. The kavod's for me. That's a Russian. So they're always lurching into different directions in terms of what will give me Ultimately, everything we do, so many things we do, is what will provide me another degree of status. Okay? And the, the tzaddik is the person that is invested with all the exact same qualities, same desire to give covet, same ability to harness all their creative energy, all kinds of, you know, same ability to learn, but they know that all of that should be directed to covet Shemayim. And that's, that's a distinction. Avram taught where we, what we do with everything, and that makes us a whole different kind of person. And Bilam said, do not, there's nothing beyond yourself to direct it to. It's just for yourself. And those people that believe that there's something out there to direct it to, they are our enemy. We have a great example. We say to him, it's the lead. Yes. The, correct. Choices, yes. Choices, correct. Choices. Correct. David understood clearly that his role as king is a example for not his own kavod, but kavod shemaim. And the second he deviated, he he apologized. When he shifted, the yetsahara is that drive. Simply, the yetsahara is just saying, take all yetsar, yotzer. Your creative energy. Take everything that's been invested in you by Hashem, okay, and just misuse it. <laughs> that's all.